best teacher that we've all found in Jesus. It's a very good time. As we get started this morning, I wanted to uh, take a minute and encourage everyone uh, to vote. If you haven't already, I already voted and dropped off my ballot this week. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I did as far as voting and urge you to do the same. You're not supposed to do that in church, Rob. I'm like, well, okay, there's a lot of things I'm not supposed to do, but here we are. Um, first, uh, going up to the propositions, because those things are very confusing. I spent, you can ask my wife, I spent weeks looking over those things, reading and looking up definitions and trying to see if they were saying what they're actually saying, or they were only saying the thing they wanted me to think that they were saying, when well, they weren't saying that thing at all. Because that's what it's like reading one of those things. It's like the worst case scenario on a math problem, right? On the PSAT. If a, uh, if a train leaves at 2 o'clock on a Thursday and the color purple weighs 18 pounds, I don't, I don't know what this means. So uh, let me summarize it for you. I voted no on all of the propositions except for two. Prop 20 and Prop 22. Prop 22 I spoke about months ago, gig work. We're allowing Uber guys and Lyft people to be able to work. 22 is very vital because at some point you're going to want somebody to come and paint your house and you don't want to have to pay, pay for their benefits in order to paint your house. It's ridiculous and it's a unionization of things. So I know this is probably upsetting for some folks, but I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead and do it. 20 is, of course, criminal reform. People should go to jail for doing crimes. A little weird, I know. So no on everything except 20 and 22 for me. That's what I voted. So I voted yes on 20 and 22, going up the ticket. Um, the water district guys, pick your poison. Uh, the water's going to cost too much, and you're going to complain the whole time you pay the bill. That's it. Um, on a local level, for our state representation, I voted for Kelly Sciardo. I uh, appreciate his viewpoints and his values are very much line up with mine. Ken Calvert, I'm voting Republican up ticket. Uh, Ken Calvert's been there for years and years, and I would want him gone only based on, uh, I believe, er there should be term limits everywhere. Nobody should spend that long in office, period, at all, ever. No matter how much I like him, no matter how much they do for me, see, in eight years, you're done. Get gone. Bye. See ya. Okay? That's how it should be. But given that's what we have. An up ticket, I'm voting for, I voted for President Trump. Um, I just decided that that was the right thing to do. Voted for him in 2016. Here's the thing that's interesting, guys. You need to have this in mind. Again, you're, my liberal Christian friends are telling me that your kingdom is not of this earth. You shouldn't tell anybody what to do. You shouldn't even care to vote. But all the while, they got their little black screen flying. They got their little promos that they're doing social justice thing. So I want to tell you this. The only candidate that the police associations throughout the country support is President Trump. The only party that I saw that said you shouldn't burn down cities is the Republican Party. And so that's what I'm voting for. Uh, I believe I could extrapolate for you uh, in great detail what I believe that Trump has done that's positive for this country. Your mileage may vary, your mileage may differ. If you don't know anything at all and you're like, I'm gonna sit this one out, I'm not gonna vote on anything, I really would like to chastise you on that and say you shouldn't. You should not. You should not sit this one out, even if you only know one thing. If you vote for one office, if you only vote for the things next to an R on them, I am telling you, go ahead and do that. That's my conviction, and that's the one I'm living out. I know that doesn't line up with everybody's politics, and I know I've offended somebody, but honestly, I'm done and in love. I'm not angry. I'm not going to burn anything down. You can't spell condemn without D-E-M, and yet the, the Democrats are as silent as the N in the word over these last months, over the wickedness that's gone on. And so uh, that's what I'm voting for. That's what I'm doing. If you need any further clarification, we've got some uh, information out in the entry area. You can uh, go into realimpact.us. They have some voter guides and some information for you that helps explain some of those propositions. I would urge you to grab those pieces of information. That said, let's get to our teaching this morning. If you can still hear me through all of my political homes, Hullabaloo. Not my intention, again, to anger anybody, but to inform everyone and to engage in discussion, loving discussions, but always embracing truth. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the truth of love, part three, and this title is For Every Occasion. Love is, of course, for every occasion. Um, let me cover the three verses that I think that are very important for us to have in mind. We've been talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised, and he told us that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. John 16, 13 says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, and that is all truth about everything. I believe the Holy Spirit can guide your life into all truth in every area. You're sitting there, man, should I take this overtime assignment this week? I'd be away from the family more than I've ever been. Pray about it. Let the Holy Spirit guide you into all truth for that. What should I make for my family's dinner this week? God doesn't care about that. Yes, he does. 
He'd be glorified in everything, every decision that you make from the route you drive to work. Ask him about stuff. Ask him about stuff. If you need truth, he has all truth. Ephesians 1, I want to give this assurance to every believer. Ephesians 1.13 says, When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Every believer, everyone who has called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved has the Holy Spirit living in us. That is great good news. A sign, a seal, a promise. And finally, Galatians 5, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Galatians 5.22 says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we've been talking about love. And of course, the key passage on love, and we've all heard it if we've been to a wedding anywhere at any time, in the United States anyway, 1 Corinthians 13.4 says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice. But rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And then we broke that up into three parts. Remember, there's three different panels. What love is. Love is patient, kind, always hopeful, enduring through everything, and rejoicing in truth. Love is not jealous, boastful, proud, rude, demanding, or selfish, irritable, rejoicing with injustice. And then finally, love never keeps record of wrongs, gives up or loses faith. And we've talked about that one in particular over the last couple of meetings because the things that love never is is the things that I'm really good at as a human being person. I'm really good at keeping record of wrongs. I'm really good at giving up. I'm really good at losing faith. And so we wanted to explore the scriptures and find out how the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth and how love delivers us from the things that love never is. Isn't that amazing? The thing that we're focusing on, the fruit that's being produced in our lives by the presence and the power and the work of the Holy Spirit is the thing that will deliver us from all the things that it's not. And that seems like, of course, like if you're painted, uh, you've painted a wall pink, it's not yellow anymore, right? If you're painted with love, you're not not love anymore. It makes sense, but on the other hand, isn't it glorious to be delivered by love? (laughs) I say this uh, over and over, and I wish I could find a better way to say it, but it's fascinating. Through all of our lives, we are conditioned to respond and change by being shamed, manipulated, embarrassed, and fearfulness. Those are the things that motivate us. You better or else. Well, I wish you just could, but God does not shape our lives that way. Instead, he pours gifts into our lives and his spirit living through us leads us to change behavior he doesn't manipulate us he doesn't threaten us he doesn't humiliate us he doesn't embarrass us nobody is like god (laughs) nobody is like god he pours gifts into our lives and imagine that here's the first thing that comes to your mind put it this way if i tried to get my kid to do what he wants by only giving him gifts all the time he would be a spoiled brat and i look at the church and i go interesting we didn't make that connection (laughs) You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying when you can walk away from any church that you please because they rubbed you the wrong way that day. I'm out of here. I'll go to another one. I'll go to that one. I'll go there. That sounds like a spoiled little kid. Well, I'm just going to take my ball and go home. And church after church looks like that. That's how we get transfers. And that's what's been our driving force as we talk about as elders whether or not to open up the church and, 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 and stop abiding by the government imposition. We said the church is supposed to be dedicated to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and prayer. Who are we to take that from you? God gave us one job, to provide a place where people could grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're just going to be faithful in that and show up. And who shows up, shows up. But I could never take that from you guys. Never. This is your community. This is the people you belong with because Jesus made you belong to him. And because you belong to him, we belong together. So here we are right here we are first corinthians 13 13 says three things will last forever faith hope and love and the greatest of these is love on wednesday night we went through and talked about how love practically delivers us from the things that love is never all right in uh, colossians 3 12 we read this since god chose you to be the holy people he loves you must clothe yourselves with tender heart and mercy Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What's fascinating is if you look at those list items, those are all fruits of the Spirit that the Spirit produces us. 
So it's not like we go over to our closet and go, oh, we got a white t-shirt and jeans. That was my official, what well, still is, uh, the official uniform through all of school. White t-shirt, blue jeans, that's all I had in the closet. If you looked in my closet, you'd open it and see, this is not so for the believer. God equips us. He has filled your closet with outfits of his love to adorn you in. And so he says you must be clothed as God's holy people, as his set-apart people in the clothing he set apart for you. Verse 13 says, make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you, and remember that the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Giving you a brief rundown on how we talked about that on Wednesday, about letting the grace of God flow into our lives, specifically in forgiveness. That's the number one place where God delivers us from all three of those points of things that love is never. Love never keeps a record of wrong. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith, right? And look how he does it through these practical means of the scripture. Forgiving means absorbing all the cost of a debt, whether it's a financial debt or something that I have been wronged in. In this case, forgiving may indeed involve a debt of money, but most often it is absorb absorbing the hurt of a sin or offense against us. So forgiveness puts love over all of our offenses, both the offenses that we give and the offenses that we receive. The stuff that happens to us and, and the us that happens to other people, forgiveness is designed to wrap us up in love. Number one, make allowance for faults. There's things that bug us about other people, and some of these things are rooted in faults and in cracks and in gaps in their behavior toward us, but they're not necessarily sin. You might rake leaves a different way than I rake leaves when we're working together. Why are you doing that wrong? Was the object to pick up the leaves and put them in this bucket? Yeah, but you're doing it wrong. Are my leaves going in this bucket? Yeah, but you're doing it wrong. Now, that's your preference. Lighten up, Francis, right? <laughs> Just start raking leaves. There's some things that I will do that will bug you, but it's not a sin issue. It's just like, I rub people the wrong way. Why? Because I'm weird. Like nobody needed that t-shirt made, right? We all knew it. Number two is forgive anyone who offends you. It's interesting in this one that all of our offenses are covered. Faults between us, faults, uh, offenses taken or given, and any offense. So it might just be that I bug you, but it might be that I did something sinful and wrong towards you. Both need to be forgiven, all right? Number three, the Lord forgave me, so I must forgive. And look at this. My sin against God is not about quirks or preferences. Oh, no. My sin is a violation of God's holiness. It's not like we don't understand each other well. He has made himself perfectly known, and when I sin, it's because I'm wrong. He's always right, always holy, always just, always pure. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the disposition of forgiveness. Knowing everything I would do to violate his holiness, God still created me, God still made me, and 2,000 plus years ago, he died for me. And so that type of forgiveness needs to flow into my heart. I must be aware of that because I'm going to be required to forgive in the same way that I've been forgiven. And so you can see immediately, you can't keep track of wrongs against you if you're going to forgive like Jesus forgave. He takes our sins and he puts them as far as the east is from the... Oh, good. We're all on the same page. So we didn't even need to review that. You guys already knew it. That's great. But Colossians 3.14 is the next section. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Clothe yourselves with love. And this is the love that comes from God. And this is where we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to help us sort out our outfits. I know a lot of guys don't like to do that, but ladies, I know you like to pick out your outfits, and you are waiting. You are waiting right now to be able to put on your seasonal outfits. The pumpkin spice molecules will reach a certain density at some point, and you'll all be able to wear your comfy, cozy sweaters and your scarves. <laughs> but we haven't reached it. We've got pumpkin spice deficit. Some of you guys need to work harder on this. I'm convinced that's what makes the fall happen, pumpkin spice molecules in the air. Nobody else believes my science, but it's as credible as other science we've been given lately. Clothe myself in love ties back to the Holy Spirit leading us, in, us into all truth about love and shows us how all the characteristics of love will heal, shape, and fill every interaction in our lives. Did you hear that? God's love will heal, fill, and shape every interaction 
on your life. You no longer have to go, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I don't know what to think about this. What will happen when? What will happen if? You don't have to worry about those things. The closet is full. All of the ways for you to be outfitted in the love of Jesus Christ is provided for you by the Holy Spirit you already have living in you as a believer. It's all there. Love is patient, kind, always hopeful, enduring through everything, rejoicing in truth. Love is not jealous, boastful, proud, rude, demanding, selfish, irritable, rejoicing with injustice. And love never keeps a record of wrongs, never gives up, and never loses faith. So in my interactions with people, love has many looks. Love has many colors. Love has many layers. Be careful. I want you to notice this about 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and following isn't telling us to do all of these things that love is about perfectly at once. Sometimes you can look at that as a list and go, I don't even have one thing on this list and I'm supposed to do all of them at once? No, see, that'd be as crazy as going up to your closet and going, I don't know what the day's going to, I'm going to put on all the clothes. I'm going to put on all the clothes. I might need fuzzy socks, but it might be pretty warm. So I'll put on the quarter socks, then the full fuzzy wool socks. Then I'll put on... I might want to, I'll wear, put on shorts, and then I'll put on pants over the shorts. And then I'll put on a t-shirt, and then I'll put on a, a long sleeve shirt, and then a sweater under that, and then I'll have my big coat, and I better put my rain slicker on. I want to have all the clothes on in case everything happens at once. We don't live like that, do we? No, we can't live like that. And yet, God's love, his rich love, is accommodating all of these places in our lives. And we're not sitting here going, well, what am I going to need? I better take some of this and some of those and three of those. No, 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 no. You're being led by the Holy Spirit living in you, who readily will provide all of these things for you immediately according to their need. It's not a checklist or even an order of operations. This description deepens our understanding and eagerness to reach into the love provided by God's presence through the Holy Holy Spirit in us and just enjoy it. Just to live the rich, full life God has promised each of us. Colossians 3.14 tells us to put on love, to clothe ourselves in love. It means to be outfitted in love. And the beauty of 1 Corinthians 13 is that it gives us so many ways to live out love, whether you're in a beautiful place or a broken place, right? When we need a different outfit, sometimes at the end of our rope, there is still daylight left. Thanks to them moving around the clock, it's an hour closer, but uh, you ever notice that? You're at the end of your rope and you're not done with your day, not even close. What do you do with that leftover time? Sometimes at the end of our rope, we have daylight left and there's, there's people all around us and they're weird and they're quirky, right? Sometimes our problems don't know that it's quitting time. Sometimes our problems don't even recognize that it's past bedtime. Sometimes our problems don't care if it was supposed to be vacation time, and they really don't care if we were supposed to leave for work 15 minutes ago. Our problems are inconsiderate and invasive. Sometimes the weather changes on you, and you can't go home and get a do-over, can you? You ever had that happen? You ever been caught without the right outfit? Oh, that's the worst but you have an umbrella, you have a sweater, you take the gift you have at your fingertips and you take your shelter in it and that's what the Holy Spirit provides. Gifts for you to live in, to live through and to live through you. You ever go to the beach on a really nice day and you start to walk across the sand barefoot and my goodness, the sand is hotter than you thought. Well, that's it, pack it in, we gotta go back home. I'll go back home, I'll get some snowshoes because those will protect me from the hot s- No, you don't do that. You go, good thing I got these sandals. And here's the thing. Nobody likes that, right? You want to just walk across me. When you put your sandals back on, sand, it's nasty, right? It's coarse, it gets everywhere. Nobody likes it. <laughs> you either sprint towards the water or take a minute and put your sandals on. You're better outfitted for not cooking your tootsies in the sand, Right? You take what's there. You take what's available. And what I'm telling you is that what's available to you as a believer in the Holy Spirit, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived what Jesus has for you in the midst of a problem or a predicament. You are not without respite. You are fully outfitted. 
Love is always available to the believer to go through the believer, all by the work of the Holy Spirit. We will be perfectly outfitted not just to survive, but instead to thrive while we live in community with others. I keep saying that. Uh, Why is that important, community with others? Why do you keep talking about we belong together because we belong to Jesus? Because we were made for community. We were made in the image of God, and God himself is in community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We were made in the image of God. We weren't supposed to be alone. You may have occasions when you go, I got to recharge the batteries. I just need a minute. But you were designed overall for community, right? You're meant to be a part of a family of people to belong to one another. It is not good for us to be alone. That's the Bible. That's Genesis right at the beginning, right? So look at all the colors, features, and flavors of love. Even some of our oldest cliches are founded in 1 Corinthians 13, and I bet you already noticed a couple of them. Remember the old say, if you can't say something nice, love is not rude. Oh, hey, look at that. Yeah, see, I told you I wasn't making it up. I wouldn't do that to you guys. This is a big one, especially during holidays, and especially if you have to sit next to me at a dinner table. Shut up, Rob. No, love is not rude. Be easy on me, right? <laughs> Rather than be overwhelmed with our inability to perfectly live out and manifest our love in all of these ways, all of the time, the fruit of the Spirit, love, is able to be displayed in any and in all of these many ways, expressions, and yet me pick a word carefully, formats. So many outfits. So how do we know which one is just right? How? How would we know? Well, I want to take us back to Philippians chapter 4, 6, and 7. If you want to know, you cry out to God in prayer. Okay, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And anybody that's penciling in family holidays with the Newsoms, they're like, um, I can never tell. Is that too far? Okay. So you're penciling in your date for your family Thanksgiving, right? And you're like, oh, no, but Rob's going to be there. What are we going to talk about? You get to practice your verbal and conversational jujitsu, man. You got to steer him away from all his irritating, weird habits. What am I going to do? God, I'm dreading seeing him. Call out to the Lord in prayer. Don't worry. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. I need to not throttle Rob at the dinner table and thank him for all he has done. I think I need this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I think interacting with my family might look like this this year. And I've spoke with several friends who are like, yeah, my family told us not to come over. Yikes. (laughs) Wow. I think I need this. Holy Spirit, sort me out. It says there, though, the promise continues. It says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. If you have this verse stored up in your heart, this is good news. You can put this promise over the present problems immediately. Do you see, that's what we're doing in prayer. We're taking God's promises and putting them over the problem. All right, Lord, here's what we got. You got to fix this, right? We're taking God's promises and we're putting them over the problem because God's promises are always bigger than our problems and our circumstances and our needs abundantly more than what we could ask, think, or imagine. Even as the problem is presenting itself, that's the great thing. Over and over scripture, you see Nehemiah, he's before the king. I'd never been downcast before the king. Something was wrong about my attitude, my demeanor, whatever. The king said to me, what's wrong with you today? I prayed and said, that's what, bam, bam, just right there. Oh my goodness, I wasn't careful with my facial expressions just now. I did not keep my poker face on and now I need to give an answer for what's going on. And the Lord provided for Nehemiah the exact right words at the exact right time. Let me tell you about this prayer though from Philippians 4, 6, and 7. This prayer brings us into love which rescues us right out of love never. Remember we were talking about that on Wednesday. I mentioned that at the beginning. Look at how, let me show you how this prayer, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, lifts us out of the things that love never is, okay? Love never keeps record of wrongs. Love never loses uh, hope, never gives up, never loses faith, right? That's what we talked about. Let me show you how that practice works with this Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Prayer brings us into love. We're not losing faith because we're talking to God, who is the focus of our faith. So love never loses faith. Well, we won't when we're talking to God because he's the object of my faith, right? So immediately, prayer rescues us from one of the things that love never does. Love never loses faith. Prayer delivers you. 
Prayer is God's means of love to rescue you from the things that love never is. Number two, we're not giving up because we're walking with Jesus through our need, talking to the only one who can fix where we are at and what we need. We are not losing faith and we are not giving up. We're talking to the one who can deliver us. And finally, we're not keeping a record of wrongs, but keeping a record instead in these instructions of this prayer of all that God has done. Tell him what you need. Thank him for all he's done. I'm not lamenting at what is not. I am instead celebrating what God has already provided for me. Do you see how love delivers us from the things that love never is? And it does it through this prayer. What an amazing mechanism, means, interaction, whatever label you need to put on it, Jesus provides this for us. It's an additional gift that delivers us from all the things love is not. So we pray and we have God's promises treasured up. That is to say, however many verses and promises God has uh, stored up in your heart and however many of those you've treasured, that's just like a, a thing that you get to go and every time a problem comes along, I know a verse for that, I know a verse for that, I know a verse for that, I know it. But even if you only know one verse, for God so loved the world, I am loved, that he gave his one only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If only that's the one you know, that's a great one because it focuses on Jesus and all the promises of Jesus are death proof. <laughs> I am dearly loved. If you only know one thing, I am dearly loved. I've got a big problem, but I am loved by God. There it is. Again, love delivers us from the things that love never is. We pray and we have God's promises treasured up. The weather changes, the circumstances go suddenly bad and we are faced with someone treating us like the enemy. We're facing a set of circumstances that could devour us if our faith was resting in a good day or a bad day, but instead our faith is resting in Jesus Christ. So we pray in faith and we remember the Holy Spirit is producing in us love. So now we have all these things to respond with. And here's the best thing about 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 4 and following in the descriptions of what love is, love is not, and love is never. Nothing has to be said. Nothing has to be said. All of these characteristics of love can paint the interior of your heart. When people are yelling at you and screaming at you, it gives you the permission, I would say it gives you the direction to shh, to be still and know that God is God. You don't have to say a thing at all. The Holy Spirit makes it so I don't even have to think badly. <laughs> you see what this love does for us? Look at how many of these gifts can be enjoyed in silence. Let's go through. Love is not jealous. Love is not jealous. When I'm not getting the attention I wanted, I needed, or I deserved, love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. When I'm getting all the attention or when I told you so could be said, instead, no, I'm not keeping record of wrongs no matter how many times you got wrong. <laughs> no matter how many of the trivial pursuit pies you're missing and I have, I'm not going to boast about it. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Love is not proud. When it turns out I was right the whole time, I don't have to say anything. I don't have to say anything at all. Love is not rude. When I want to hurt you back, silence is golden. Love is not demanding or selfish. When I've given too much and I just don't have any more, when it's my turn to get attention, to get my way, to be heard, to say my peace, to just have a minute, love is not demanding or selfish. Love is not irritable. Oof, this one's a rough one for me. <laughs> when I just need a minute... And the best way I know to get that minute is to bark them away. Rawr, rawr, rawr. I like the snarling dog. Isn't that something? Don't you ever feel like that's what it feels like when you're irritable? Rawr, growling the whole time, teeth drool. Rawr, right? The best way to get that minute is to snap at them, to slam a door, to growl, and let them know I need space. And this one's interesting because it goes along with being easily offended. And I want to bring this up because it's become a value culture. Just because you're really, really offended doesn't mean you're right. You could be mad as a wet cat and it won't make you right. How many times have you done that? We have it happen all the time at our house. We'll be going back and forth with some trivial thing. We're like, no, it was 1991. It was 1993. It was 91. It was 19. I'm going to look this up and show you how wrong you were. 
Oh, man, it was 93. She was right. Ah! Me being upset, humiliated, embarrassed doesn't change the facts that it was indeed the wrong answer that I was having. I get so upset, so embarrassed, I can't believe I did that. It's, did it magically change to 93? No. Okay. You being super offended does not make you more right. No matter how many buildings you burn down, you're still not right. It's still injustice. No matter how many people in the news media celebrate you burning down buildings and throwing rocks at cops and doing horrible things, no matter how much the world rejoices at that injustice, it's still injustice. You could get as fired up as you want. It's still wrong. Being a huge sports fan, I remember 1979, I bring this up last weekend, this week, when the Rams lost to the Steelers in the Super Bowl. I was so furious, and I, the next morning, I was so mad, and I got out the paper. The score's the same! <laughs> Twelve-year-old me, full of wrath and vigor and anger. <sighs> but being mad didn't change any of it. Doesn't change any of it. Just because I'm offended doesn't mean I'm right. I might be really fired up and be completely wrong. It does not rejoice with injustice. I want to speak this one. Finally, they're getting what they deserve. It doesn't matter that it wasn't fair, but at least now they got a taste of their own medicine. I'm, not, I'm the only person that's ever said those words? I can't be. I can't be. Jesus absorbed the cost of all injustice. Think about that. Injustice is what ran the whole system that murdered Jesus. And the cost of all injustices all fell on Christ himself. And now I'm going to root for injustice because they deserve to know what it's like. Do you understand (laughs) that when we root for injustice, we specifically reach into the toolbox that was used to kill Jesus Do not celebrate injustice. No matter how much they deserve it, no matter how much they had it coming, no matter what you generate in your heart of going, yeah, get away from that. Repent from that. Run away from rejoicing in injustice. Notice that going the opposite of love produced by the Holy Spirit is never land. (laughs) The things that love is never Every time you respond opposite the Holy Spirit, you're going to the things that love is never. Please remember that. Love is patient. If I'm keeping records of wrong, I'm relying on my patience, not God's. And so I need God's love to flow through me. The clock is always ticking for everyone to run out of my patience because I only got a little bit. But love is patient. God is tireless in his love. He is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, wanting everyone to turn from their sin and be welcomed into the kingdom of God. Love is kind. This is doing good instead of revenge. This is active grace after mercy. Let me run that by you. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is getting what you never deserved. This is active grace after mercy, the kindness of God's love. Mercy is not getting your just desserts, and grace is getting a good thing that you never earned. Love is always hopeful. That means love doesn't even keep track in pencil. (laughs) Well, I didn't carve it into stone. I didn't even write it down in pencil. Love, always hopeful. It's always hopeful. Not even right now. It's probably, you know, I'm going to write this down so I can tell you guys later. I I showed you, Maria. I I knew it was going to go like this. That's not hopeful. That's not hopeful. Love is always hopeful. Love is enduring through everything. This is not egg timer obedience. You ever uh, start to do little bits of fitness thing? I know that planking is not as popular as it once was, but you get on the ground, you're doing planking, like, 30 seconds, how hard can that be? But when you've never done it before, you're like, <laughs> sweat pouring off the phone, psh, sparks flying. <laughs> Josiah was doing these things, these wall sits. Come on down, let's see if we can do these wall sits. And see, there's this old man pride thing where you would rather die then show a younger guy stronger than you, right? So we're sitting there doing the wall sets. He says, just try it for 30 seconds. I'm like, you're no problem. I'm talking really easy. He goes to the other room. I go into my room, lay on the floor and cry. <laughs> what did he do to me? It said wall sit. That didn't feel like sitting. 
30 seconds felt like an eternity, right? There's nothing harder than enduring under pressure. And love is always enduring through everything. It's not egg time or obedience. It is instead Christ-guarded peace. Remembering our Philippians 4, 6, and 7, that's how we're enduring this life we live. We live by trusting in Jesus Christ who loves us and gave himself for us. That's how you endure. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the suffering and the shame of the cross. He has road tested the endurance that he provides for us and has proven that it is road worthy for all of our lives. Uh, lastly, love is rejoicing in truth. That is a joyful confidence that the Holy Spirit is, as we've been talking about, leading us into all truth. And that is all truth about everything. Well, I don't know if that's accurate, Rob. Why would the Bible have instructions for me on what job to take or, or not to take or, or what neighborhood to move in or not to move in? Why does, that doesn't seem to be anywhere in the Bible. Thou shalt not buy the blue hut. It doesn't say that in the scriptures. And yet the Lord is leading us into all truth over everything. Even the house you buy, the job you take or don't take, the overtime you work or don't work, the vacation you do or do not take, the words you say or the words you sit on. Every part of our life, the Holy Spirit is trying to guide us into all truth. And it is all foundational on God's love for us. I said it before, I'll say it again. Sometimes when faced with adverse circumstances, situations and problems, difficult people, sometimes you sit, and this I'm going to use a word phrase here for you, the best you can do is not wish them dead. (laughs) You're not supposed to say that. I can't be the only one who's thought it. You're not supposed to wish. Well, I hope they get a flat tire before they get here for the Christmas party. <gasps> but the Holy Spirit invites us through these presence and powers of love. Look, you hear they're, they're doing something terrible and rude. Well, I'm not going to wish any evil upon them. That's love, you guys. You don't have to sit there and go, well, here, I will go to, let me, I'll be right back. You're being terrible. Let me go down to the, the Walmart and get you a nice gift and let me get you a card and let me try. And, no, sometimes it's just a matter of just, I'm going to sit here and be content in Jesus Christ. Lord, Jesus, I, I, right now, I want to yell and scream and then throttle them and slam and flip the table over. And you, No, I'm just going to be c- quiet. And I'm going to be calmed by your love. I'm going to be quieted by your love. I'm going to tell you what I need. Lord, I need to just be still and know that you are God. And he will allow you to patiently and lovingly endure. Take you a a journey a thousand miles away in your heart and mind. And deliver you from that present circumstance. That's the truth about love. It really, truly works. When the Holy Spirit is pouring his presence through your life, there is nothing that can stop it. This is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And you don't think you can sit through here in Auntie's story for the 19th time? Absolutely you can. Absolutely you can sit there and simply be still and know that God is God. Look at the promise. Philippians 4, 7 and Colossians 3, 15 are very interesting. They go so well together. Philippians 4, 7 says, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds our understanding and guards our hearts and minds as we live this life we live by trusting in Jesus. Galatians 2, 20. And then Colossians 3, 15. And let. There it is. Let. That means it's there. And let. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Rule in your hearts. There is peace channeling into your hearts right now through Jesus Christ. All you have to do is let it. All you have to do, that's all that's required. Let that peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And just always be thankful the truth about love. Let the message about Christ in all of its fullness, all of its richness, fill your lives. Here's something that God has been telling me to invite me into the rich, full life Jesus has for me. He leads me to himself with these gifts. He gives gifts. Jesus' incentive for me is he himself. He is my incentive. The presence of the perfect embodiment of love and of belonging and acceptance in relationship with God. Jesus says, I had it, I have it, and I give it to you. I always do what pleases the Father. This is the life I have for you. To live in the delight and the smile of God. Everyone else motivates with punishment. They will shun you. 
They will humiliate you. They will deprive you. Jesus says to me, he says, Rob, you know what? You're a mess. Yep. Here are my gifts that will flow through your heart and life, and they will, all of them, every single one, in every aspect, draw you closer to me. And I have rest for your weary soul. You are loaded down with all sorts of heavy things I never intended you to carry. You are weak from being discouraged, and you are always ready to give up hope. You need my gifts. Jesus says, you need my love. You need my comfort. You need my belonging. You need my acceptance. You're looking everywhere else, but it's right here. Bought, paid for, tested, and lovingly provided into my heart and life. Let go of that stuff and let me fill your heart. Let me fill your mind. Let me fill your soul. Let me fill your spirit and fill you up with all of the gifts that will sustain you. Don't be satisfied with just surviving. (laughs) Instead, find the joy in Jesus Christ of thriving in his rich, full life. This is the truth. This is all the truth about love. And I'm barely scratching the surface. But this is the gift that Jesus has provided for all of us. This is the truth about love. It is for you. God loves you. And he wants to pour his spirit through every part of your life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for our morning together. I pray this has been a time of encouragement for everybody in the church family, Lord, that they have heard your love declared, that they know your grace and mercy, they know your goodness and your kindness, that they've heard the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit and they are content that this is the place to be, to be still and know that you are God. I pray that no one would walk away from this place empty-hearted, broken, or or wounded. I pray, Lord God, that we would come to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for you. You are the best part of your promise. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for our morning together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.